It's great to see the unknown pleasures screenings of Australian films that deserve to be seen by a wider audience continues at the Thornbury Picture House. And coming up are two films by Matthew Victor Pastor. Um, and the films are um, In Heaven They Sing Karaoke and A Pencil to the Jugular. And to talk to me about those two films and the screenings, etc., we have Matthew with me right now. Matthew, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Hello. Hey, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you. Now, uh, it's interesting. Yes, I, I, I think I've spoken to you previously, but we've, we've had, uh, you've had about 18 credits, short films and uh, feature films to your, uh, <laughs> to your filmography, and uh, which, is, which is terrific. I'm really intrigued because you're a Filipino Australian uh, filmmaker, and that uh, a lot of your films do focus on that perspective. Um, tell me about your process in making your films and deciding how you go about them. Yeah, um, so I'm kind of in a bit of a transitional period in how I see uh, my process now. Uh, as the films that were previously made, I, I tried to view everything more like how a painter can paint or a, um, a, a musician that wants to jam can pick up an instrument and play it. I kind of viewed filmmaking from that perspective, um, very kind of uh, free flowing. Uh, obviously making a film involves a lot of collaboration and involves um, a lot of, uh, I guess, um, if it's you know, in the context of the Filipino diaspora, uh, collaborating and conversations and all these different things. But the, the end product was always, um, I guess, feelings that were just spilt out onto a page and then translated to uh, a screen of, um, you know, or filmed in some way. So I've always viewed it that as my process previously. Now, I haven't made a film in a while, partly because I'm starting to try and refine that process. And um, not that in any way that those films aren't, um, you know, uh, beautiful works. And I, th I think they're really beautiful and, I, and I, love, I love them a lot, but I'm trying to, I guess, uh, see things differently now. So yeah, that's, that's kind of uh, my process, I guess, or was my process. Um, maybe I'll go back to that very soon when I just feel that itch to make another film, but yeah. Um, okay. No, it's interesting to hear that the paradigm that you use or or have uh, modified as you've been uh, making your film. So that that's uh, very interesting. So let's talk about the first of all the first one screening on November fifteenth, which I read is a work in progress. Um, in heaven they sing karaoke, which is uh, about uh, Filipino migrants in Australia and their um, situation. Uh, tell me about the concept behind that and and the docudrama sort of approach that also is part of the, the this film. Actually, um, that is uh, originally the story was made by Felina Deloso, who is the lead uh, actor in the film. And Felina wrote a stage play uh, that's basically a one man show. And we took, um, we talked about it and I went off and just wrote a version of it, which involved multiple characters uh, and uh, took his idea, which was about a, what we call Tago and Tago or TNT, which is a person who lives in uh, another country without a visa. Um, so there is a, a group of Filipino migrants across the world that do this um, for whatever, for whatever reasons they fall through the cracks of society. And a lot of them, um, you know, do this for, for reasons like sending money back home, because, you know, in the Philippines, you know, we have rampant poverty um, and things like that. So um, some, some of these people do, do these things for noble reasons. Sometimes it's just society um, and the way that people fall between the cracks. And that was the whole concept of the story. So this TNT uh, that Felino wrote and was playing the character of I expanded that into a ensemble drama, I guess, with still Felino being the core of it. And yeah, Felino was really the, the glue that held that whole, whole um, process together. That is so interesting, the way you describe that. And as you say, based on a play. So juggling that um, uh, filmmaking process as a, uh, as a documentary slash docudrama and as almost a narrative, uh, in many respects. Um, tell me about that sort of process. 
Yeah, um, Felino uh, comes from uh, a theatre background, and uh, you know he studied. He's actually he studied the VCA a long, long time ago. I'm talking like. I think he, I mean, you know, now it's, uh, you know, there's a lot more Asian Australian actors, but I feel like Felino might've been like really an OG there. Like he's, he's, cause he's, 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 you know, a few decades old, maybe, you know, the generation before mine. So he, it's really cool that he's, he's been um, able to hone his craft and, um, and come from that background and, and be able to um, create something like this. Um, but yeah, that, that whole process and also like using um, elements of theatre, but also another performative element, karaoke, which the, in the Filipino, um, if you've ever been to a Filipino um, party, there's always like, you know, red horse, uh, beer, uh, karaoke, and um, just, you know, just, all, you know, all this beautiful food and, and, and fun. But I wanted to subvert those things because the karaoke is such a joyous concept. And this film really plays with that. Um, there's a bit of a breaking of the fourth wall there because the karaoke element of the film is really a melancholy, um, melancholy melody that's used. And the whole film is uh, kind of that kind of process. And, and I guess, I mean, I know it's a work in progress, but there is an element of the film that is always a work in progress, just partly because of uh, the fragmented nature of, of the, the story I'm trying to tell. And maybe, that's part of why this film has taken a bit of time to put together because of that collage of, 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 of feelings and melodies and trying to put that all together to make it into something. Um, yeah, but it, it's all a cohesive feeling, I think. I, I, I think it is anyway, but um, it's still a story of a survival and yeah, <laughs> that's what it is, I think, yeah. <laughs> And, and, and I, I like the way you make your films. I've, I, I've noticed you use a lot of handheld camera as well as a fixed camera. You use sometimes color and black and white, etc. So you, you, you definitely use different styles in terms of telling the story. Yeah, I think that comes from uh, my, I, I, I guess, grow, growing up with a fragmented identity in Australia, um, it kind of it comes, I think that comes organically for me, but also because I'm such a, I, I do have ADHD um, and it's not something that I tap into all the time, but I think it subconsciously comes through anyway, especially when I'm making a film. Um, I do, I actually, it, it might seem like it's all very chaotic, but there's always a screenplay. Um, actually, a lot of these choices are very conscious, but I think some of the elements that come together come from that freewheeling nature that whole um yeah the color palette changing with mood and yeah I, I really like that also that, that the, the reference point is also some of those um b cinema films you know in filipino um cinema there's a whole history of these types of films there's even a movement of pito pito films which films that were made in seven days and which this kind of falls into that category without meaning to also because of the way that the film was made we, we don't have you know the resources so we just use the locations and and it's actually shot in the actors houses and things like that so it's kind of yeah that that's probably why it comes 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 through in that kind of I guess using all that natural color that is there and the natural black and white that's there and then all these things just let it let it just kind of come come through and I hope this makes sense but yeah something yeah. like that <laughs> yeah oh. Absolutely. No, I can see how it's a very carefully planned sort of style. And it, as you say, it's not chaotic. It is it is uh, scripted and planned, etc. because I, I noticed the cohesive uh, quality of your films. Um, now, the screening on the 15th of November at the Thornby Picture House at 8.45 as part of Unknown Pleasures, uh, are you hoping to uh, get a distributor or to uh, uh, to develop the film further? How What are you hoping for that screening? Yeah, we're really hoping um, because of what happened over the last two, uh, two, two years, two and a half years or so, um, we really just need um, people to see the film, uh, industry people, because at, at this point um, where we're at with this film, I mean, it, it's been a work in progress for a while, but I, I really do think this film has um, very, uh, it's because it's a crime drama. I feel it does have an audience. So the right, the right people just need to see it, I think, and experience that in the cinema. I hope that uh, is something that does happen at this screening. But yeah, I mean, 
at the end of the day, I do understand that independent films and independent cinema, it's it's always a, it's always a tricky thing to get um, you know to get things going. So uh, it's yeah, I I can only hope that people see it, enjoy it, and uh, want to support it. Yeah. Sure, but it's always an issue, isn't it, for independent cinema? And I mean, I mean, Unknown Pleasures is great. It screens uh, Australian films that are not often seen, but uh, it's so hard to get distribution. Although I suppose with streaming services uh, and and so on now available, maybe things are getting a bit better. I don't know. Yeah, um, there's, you know, some some of the. I, it was interesting you say that because I actually experienced the film festival circuit through COVID, through the streaming platforms. And I think, yeah, it was a different experience. I think they all have their place. And um, I guess it's interesting because people, you know, the great the great thing about this that world is that people can see things that wouldn't normally be able to get access to them through the streaming services but nothing actually beats the cinema i think personally yeah. <laughs> i have a soft spot for that um and and on that note i mean i'm i'm on on like you know tiktok now and all these new things that people are using and learning how to use those things and as a millennial on, on in that world it's kind of you know people do digest things differently now you know, the 916 format, that the aspect ratio being vertical is the new language for a lot of the way that people digest things. So, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm learning every day what people want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's amazing how mobile phone technology has advanced so much that you can make a feature film. And there have been some examples um, on that format. Yes. Yeah. I mean... I, I actually um, think some of the best um, films, uh, you know, have been made with digital. Uh, my, the film that got, funnily enough, I mean, I'm not saying, I want, I'm actually planning to shoot a film on 16, by the way. So this is in no way me being like, oh, I'm not going to, you know, I love film. But I actually, um, the film that got me into filmmaking was a film called All About Lily Shushu by Shunji Aiwa. It was a Japanese uh, film from 2002. And that was when the digital cameras from Panasonic were first released. And there's all these out of focus shots, the highlights are blown out, the colors are super vibrant. It's a very Japanese film. And in fact, it cuts to like a one chip VHS camera, not VHS, no, sorry, one chip mini DV camera throughout the film too. So it's, it's a collage of images. And Shunji Aiwai came from like a, a music video directing um, background too, previously in, in some of his earlier work. So, you know, all these, every, every, like, you know, movement that comes, you know, digital, mobile phone, you know, DSLR filmmaking, I feel like they all have their place. And I, I don't know if mobile phone filmmaking is, 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 is necessarily cinema in the sense that now everything's vertical and people are making like the one, the one minute shorts or the three 30 second, second clips and the 15 second clips. But I feel they all have like their place in terms of narrative. And I'm quite excited to continue to explore that world. Um, the same way the filmmakers before me were able to, and you know, just, just exploring all that's quite exciting. Okay, very interesting indeed. Now, screening on the 22nd of November, uh, also at uh, 8.45, I think, is A Pencil to the Jugular, which uh, is a really a powerful film about a, a woman's experience, about violence, about sexism, about uh, race, um, uh, women's violence, etc. Uh, uh, violence to women and so on. Really interesting collection of ideas in that film. Tell me about your uh, process there so th that film was uh a, well actually it was the, the big collab collaborator on that was Lorena Zarate who was an international student at the time who um has is now um back backing back in Mexico um and the lead in the film too so I owe a lot of the uh writing and co well, the collaboration and the co-writing on that film to their amazing ability to translate feeling and emotion to screen uh but also uh add, add something very I, I i don't know if it's necessarily because because film is fiction right but it, there are personal elements to the experiences that you know littered throughout the film and uh that collaboration there and also um a lot of the other people involved with the film aren't in australia anymore at the time uh these are all people that uh i'm very close i'm very close to and, and have worked with friends and a lot of them are non-actors. So a lot of the process comes from 
just being getting a camera and shooting obviously there's a script but it's it kind of unfolds as it does it's it's hard to explain with that that film was a real chaotic film partly because it's like writing it and then lockdown and then like you have to redo everything like in you know it, I don't even know how I made it to be honest I don't know how we made it it was it was complete chaos and also I had to learn how to use a gimbal I had no crew just the actors and me and I le- learned how to radio mic them and it's I think it's a it's a beautiful work but I if you you're asking you, you know I can't even remember how that came together it's just crazy <laughs> crazy so, well, it does. Yeah. It does. It, it, uh, I mean, again, the story. You say chaotic. It's. It, uh, I wouldn't say that. I, I think it's a, a an a, a film that observes uh, again the experience of people in Australia, Filipino in particular, uh, although diverse cultures, um, and the issues and difficulties that they face in uh, in a, a society that's not necessarily very accepting. Um, um, so, uh, no, no, I think it's quite effective, but um, uh, the violent elements to the film are, are really interesting, I, the way you introduce those. Yeah, uh, well, it, it's, it's so interesting uh, when, 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 when you put it in a, in a feature film, because if you're scrolling on your TikTok or on your Instagram feed now, or Facebook now does reels, there are so many videos that you see of these things happening in Australia constantly. Like I see on my feed, I'm constantly seeing these things. Um, and that's part of how I got inspired to, to, to put this story together. Because a, a lot of those statistics were from, uh, it, was, it was a while back, um, but there was like, like a bunch of articles coming out of these uh, experiences people were having at the time, especially during the height of uh, the pandemic at the start of it. And those, those incidences are kind of very similar to the ones that were were being documented in the media um, in at the time. So, um, yeah, that's that's how those elements were introduced. Um, but I mean, like, even just trying to piece that all together in my head, because it's almost like you kind of once it's done, like once a film's made and all that, you know, you're dealing with trauma and and and, and experiences, and it kind of just. I kind of block it, blocked it out like after the film was made. I didn't want to think about it too much. Um, so yeah, yeah, talking about it or seeing it on screen is going to be very interesting because I haven't seen the film in a few months and I did see it at the Perth Film Festival and I remember watching it and being very affected by it. So um, yeah, it's it's something that, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, it's probably going to, that's a film that's probably going to change every time I watch it in terms of how I feel about it, just partly because of the themes involved. Yeah. Interesting um, you say that, and uh, um, and I think the film has screened at other film festivals uh, as well. I'm interested. Is there any commonality to the feedback that you receive about your films, and uh, and is that one of the reasons why you're constantly evolving as a filmmaker? Yeah, uh, there's. It's interesting. Yeah, the 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 the, the emotional um, response is always visceral. So partly because of how I approach the subject matter, I try not to be caught or be caught, you know, I guess, or stuck in, in a paradigm of how these kind of films are usually presented, um, top, these kind of topics in cinema. And that partly because it takes a very long time for films to be made, because when a film is being made in the system, it, you know, th- this is the way that I, I express this comes out in a very organic kind of um, almost reactionary way. And because of that, yeah, I I think there's um. Yeah, the the reaction is also visceral, um. But then. Some people are so like um. I've I've shown my films to people, um. There's been tears, sometimes anger, sometimes frustration, <laughs> uh. Sometimes you know. Joy, I mean joy in the sense that these stories are being told. Like some people really need to be to have a film that reflects their reality, I think, especially from certain backgrounds, like my, myself, I, I, like All About Lily Shushu was the film that got me into filmmaking. It is the most depressing film, but it's the film that keeps me alive as a person. Because when I see emotions like that, it makes me go, there's someone out there that understands that. So that's all I can hope for when I do something that, um, despite how sad or melancholy some of the themes are, that 
that the beauty is is there for the people that really get it. Um, so yeah, the, the reactions are always very different, and my reaction's different too. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> I just had a flashback of how how the film was made. Um, like even like shooting like tracking shots with a, a shopping basket like you know because you have one hour to do a shot so you're like trying to just time you know it's just ridiculous things like that you have one hour like in the lockdown so you're like oh one of my actors like lives on the road so can we just you know just just walk across this road to, like follow you with like while I'm holding yeah in case a cop sees me or something it's so ridiculous right like but you know sometimes you just you just really make a reactionary film and everything about it is just its own thing <laughs> Which is almost like guerrilla filmmaking in, in some respects, which goes all the way back to the French New Wave and uh, and some of the other um, uh, revolutions in cinema. Yes, yeah. It's its its own thing, I think. But Mel Melbourne's designed in a way that, that's, like, the city is such a beautiful... I don't think the city's explored enough um, in in our films. Uh, Mel the Melbourne city is so beautiful. Um, all, all I want to do is populate it with characters that I haven't seen in before in cinema in Australia. And that's what I try to do. I just try to populate my films with, you know, a time, a time capsule of that because, you know, sometimes I think it is a bit neglected. Um, but there was one film I did see that portrayed the city very interestingly recently, uh, Petrol. I saw that at Melbourne Film Festival, Petrol. I'm not sure if you saw that film, but they had some really beautiful, beautiful shots of, um, of, of, you know, inner city suburbs. And yeah, uh, I, I want to see more films with cityscapes because Melbourne's a beautiful city. So yeah, the subject matter of my films, bit sad, but the city itself, very beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Okay, so uh, the films are screening, uh, as I mentioned, 15th and the 22nd of November at the Thornbury Picture House as part of Unknown Pleasures, which is uh, curated, of course, by Chris Luskery and Bill Masoulis. And I gather, Matthew, you'll be there at both screenings? Absolutely, yep. Um, I yeah I'm really excited to see see the films again in a cinema and catch up with everyone and hopefully make meet make some new friends and see some new faces there. Excellent stuff. And just my last quick question, are you working on another film at the moment? Yes. <laughs> I am working on a film. It's actually a comedy. Um yeah, so uh maybe that's what the the, the length in I guess you you know I'm saying I'm reevaluating how I see things. Maybe it's because I'm writing in a in a much lighter tone. So <laughs> maybe that takes a bit more maybe that's out of my comfort zone and I think that's where I want to be. I want to be evolving all the time and I've done a certain type of film a lot and I'm in my I'm 33 now and I'm maybe I'm not as sad as I was 2 years ago or 3 years ago so <laughs> Well, I'm looking forward to your comedy and certainly to your, your two films screening at the Thornby Picture House, which are, are very impressive. And I urge the audience mm -hmm. uh, to go and see them. Matthew Victor Pastor, thank you so much for talking with me. No, thank you so much, Peter. Have a good one. Thank you. All the best. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.